Welcome to Hidden History and Biblical Mystery. I'm your host, Larry, and if you're new to our channel, make sure to like, share, and subscribe to join us on this journey of uncovering suppressed truths about our past. History, they say, is written by the victors, but what happens when those victors deliberately obscure, alter, and erase the truth? Today we're going to examine one of the most controversial and suppressed topics in American history, the true identity of the original indigenous peoples of these lands. Did you know that ancient American Indians might have had contact with Ireland? During the 1470s, documented evidence shows that Native Americans had already reached European shores following the Gulf Stream from the Americas to Ireland. Columbus himself encountered these Americans, at least a man and woman, at Gwe Bay in Ireland, long before his famous 1492 voyage. This momentous event, largely ignored by European historians, marks the beginning of the modern ages. It gave Columbus the absolute certainty that he could sail westward successfully. Columbus's own margin notes preserved in the Bibliotheca Columbina in Seville refer to these people he met in Ireland as coming from Cayo. The Portuguese had well-established trade with Guay, and these Native Americans had reached Ireland following the same Gulf Stream currents that would later carry other evidence of Western lands to European shores. Webster's Dictionary of 1828 defined American as originally applied to the aboriginals or copper-colored races found here by the Europeans. Not red, not Asian, copper-colored medieval geographers had already recognized three distinct Indias, with India Superior specifically referring to North America. Columbus's own navigational notes show that Kao or Kate likely referred to Yucatan rather than China, as evidenced by his descriptions um, and sailing records. In the 18th century, anthropologist Samuel George Morton documented in Crania Americana that a copper-colored skin has been assumed by most writers as a characteristic distinction of the Americans who have thus been called the copper-colored race. The Catholic Church's intentions were made explicit in the Dumb Diverses Papal Bull of 1452, where Pope Nicholas V authorized Portugal to invade, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens, Pagans, and other enemies of Christ and to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery. This wasn't speculation, this is the church's own documented policy. This aligns perfectly with Columbus's own book of prophecies completed between 1501 and 1502 and preserved in the Biblioteca Columbina in Seville where he explicitly stated his goal to recover the Holy City and Mount Zion. The Spanish crown's own records preserved in the archives of the Indies classified the indigenous peoples they enslaved as Negroes. Take a closer look at this historical painting from 1773, labeled as the pacification with maroon Negroes by European historian Brian Edwards. This artwork tells a different story. Original documentation reveals these figures are Carib chiefs from St. Vincent, Negotiating a treaty with the British, the painting features Chatoyer and Agostino Brunayas, prominent Caribbean Indian leaders, misidentified as maroon Negroes. This painting is a crucial piece of evidence, capturing a moment of historical revisionism. Here, indigenous Caribbean leaders, originally documented as Carib chiefs, were later rebranded by European historians as Maroon Negroes. Observe their features, their bearing, their dress. And these are the same, you know, the same people Spanish chroniclers described as Ethiopian-like. The Spanish crown also classified them in their records as Negroes. And these were not escaped slaves. They were the indigenous people of the Caribbean fighting to protect their ancestral lands. This painting, preserved despite attempts to relabel it, illustrates how European powers 
systematically erased and rewrote indigenous identity. They documented the original inhabitants as they appeared, then revised history to fit their narrative of an empty continent populated only by pale-skinned peoples from Asia. The truth was literally painted over, but the evidence remains for those who, who look closely. This uh, pattern of reclassification continued well into the colonial period. Cambridge University studies document that during the late 16th and 17th centuries, numerous slaves from culturally diverse communities in the Indian subcontinent and Southeast Asia were brought to Mexico on the Manila Galleon. Upon arrival, they were collectively referred to as Chinos. Portuguese explorer Antonio de Montesinos recorded in Amsterdam, Jewish community records in 1644, testified under oath about encountering indigenous peoples who practiced Jewish rituals. Early Spanish conquistadors described Mexico City as five times larger than London or Rome, with Bernal Diaz documenting 60,000 gleaming houses built of beautiful stonework and cedar wood. The National Geographic Society published findings of 12 to 13,000 year old skulls discovered in Mexico that more closely resemble native peoples of Africa, Australia, and the Southern Pacific Rim than they do their supposed American descendants. Early Spanish chronicers like Fray Diego Duran writing in 1588, consistently described encountering dark-skinned Ethiopian-like peoples throughout Mesoamerica. The Bonampak murals discovered in Chiapas provide undeniable visual evidence of our ancestors' true appearance. European scholars desperate to maintain their narrative claim these clearly dark-skinned figures merely wore ceremonial paint or ritual body decorations. This explanation defies both logic and historical precedent. What civilization would create permanent artistic records of themselves wearing temporary decorations that completely obscure their actual appearance? These murals were meant to preserve their legacy for generations. Why would why would they choose to be eternally remembered wearing face paint? The murals show people with distinct features, full lips, broad noses, and intricately styled dreadlocked hair. Characteristics these same scholars readily identify as African in other contexts. Yet when these features appear in pre-Columbian American art, suddenly they require elaborate explanations. The same academics who acknowledge that ancient cultures created art to accurately record their appearance, dress, and customs conveniently abandon this understanding when confronted with evidence that contradicts their established narrative. This isn't just about skin color. The, the murals show people with, with the same features early Spanish chroniclers described when they encountered Ethiopian-like peoples throughout Mesoamerica. So the same features the Spanish crown acknowledged when they classified indigenous peoples as Negroes in their official records. The same features that caused Carlos Cuervo Marquez to document that America was a Negro continent in his 1920 work. This isn't speculation, it's documented history and archaeological evidence. The evidence continues to mount. Carlos Cuervo Marquez, in his 1920 work, Estudios Arqueológicos y Etnográficos, documented that America was a Negro continent and that the Negro type is seen in the most ancient Mexican sculpture. This wasn't just one historian's opinion. Spanish chroniclers like Fray Diego Duran, writing in 1588, consistently described encountering dark-skinned Ethiopian-like peoples throughout Mesoamerica. Contemporary European accounts describe their amazement at finding advanced aqueduct systems bringing fresh spring water while Europe was still drinking from polluted rivers. Portuguese explorer Antonio de Montesinos, as recorded in the official records of the Amsterdam Jewish community, 
in 1644, testified under oath about finding indigenous peoples in South America who could recite the Shema and practice Jewish rituals. This testimony was so significant it led Manasseh ben Israel to write The Hope of Israel in 1650 documenting these findings. Early Spanish conquistadors arriving in what we now call Mexico City describe finding a city five times larger than London or Rome. Bernal Diaz del Castillo, in his eyewitness account, The True History of the Conquest of New Spain, documented finding great towers and buildings rising from the water. 60,000 gleaming houses built of beautiful stonework and cedar wood. He noted that the streets were so neat and well swept despite the multitude of inhabitants. The level of civilization they encountered shocked them. Temporary European accounts preserved in the Spanish archives described their amazement at finding advanced aqueduct systems bringing fresh spring water while Europe was still drinking from polluted rivers. Vicente Riva Palacio documented in his 1887 work Mexico a Traves de los Siglos specific tribes and their origins. The Spanish documented the indigenous people's use of soaps, deodorants, and breath sweeteners while as noted in multiple contemporary sources, most Europeans never bathed and kept clothes on at all times. Let's talk about the biblical connections and what the historical record actually shows. James Adair, in his 1775 work, The History of the American Indians, presented 23 specific arguments proving the Native Americans descended from the ancient Hebrews. He documented their division into tribes, their worship of Jehovah, their language similarities, and their identical religious ceremonies. This wasn't speculation. These were direct observations from someone who lived among these peoples for 40 years years. So, the evidence keeps mounting. In Pittsfield, Massachusetts in 1815, Jewish phylacteries were discovered in a Native American burial mound, according to the Pittsfield Historical Association records and contemporary newspaper accounts. These artifacts were so controversial, they were sent to Yale University, where they mysteriously disappeared a pattern we see repeated throughout history. The Smithsonian's own records reveal a pattern of suppression. Their 1939 anthropological journals document the discovery of Negro skeletal remains throughout the West Indies, remains they desperately tried to classify as post-Columbian intrusive burials. These findings were so threatening to the established narrative that scholars spent decades attempting to explain them away. The irony is that their own evidence betrays their bias. They claim these remains must be African slaves because of dental modifications, completely ignoring that dental modification was a widespread ancient practice across many cultures. But here's what's truly revealing in 2014 National Geographic published findings about ancient American skulls that more closely resemble native peoples of Africa, Australia, and the Southern Pacific Rim than they do their supposed American descendants. Think about that. Their own modern scientific analysis confirms what they've been trying to deny for centuries. When faced with this evidence, they created elaborate theories about evolutionary changes rather than accepting the simpler truth that the so-called African Americans are the indigenous peoples of the Americas and the true Native American Indians who were here long before Columbus. These aren't just isolated findings. Columbus's understanding of geography is documented in his maps. His brother Bartholomew created maps uh, showing the coast of Central America from Panama to Honduras 
as part of the east coast of Asia. These maps sent from Jamaica in 1503 um, show how Kao Kate was understood to be in the, the middle region of America. Even their own contemporary evidence keeps undermining their carefully constructed narrative. When we examine the place names across America, the evidence becomes even clearer. The original Memphis wasn't in Egypt. It was here in Tennessee. Morocco, Indiana was established in 1855. 1851, over a century before the African nation adopted that name. These aren't coincidences, they're echoes of our true history. According to their own contemporary accounts in Mort's relation from 1622, the pilgrims found established communities practicing ancient Hebrew customs. The Reverend J. Wesley Jones reported in the Scientific Herald in 1889, that when questioned about their legends, the Muscogee tribe replied, they are all in the Old Testament, go read them there. To the modern Americans, Europeans colonizers, and pretendians who love to mock these connections, explain why your own ancestors described the original inhabitants as copper-colored and Ethiopian-like. Explain why the earliest European accounts consistently describe encountering dark-skinned peoples throughout the Americas, explain why the Spanish crown itself classified the indigenous slaves they captured as Negroes. When you see people today claiming native ancestry while mocking and denying these connections, understand what you're witnessing. You're seeing the continuation of a centuries old deception. These modern pretenders aren't just wrong, they're actively participating in the erasure of true indigenous identity. The mounds found throughout North America. The Spanish chroniclers wrote about finding Ethiopian faced gods with singular cuneiform signs. They documented these findings before quickly trying to erase them from history. Why? Because these discoveries threatened their entire narrative of conquest and occupation. This hidden history isn't just academic, it's personal, it's about identity, it's about inheritance, it's about justice, and most importantly, it's about truth. A truth so powerful that after centuries of suppression, genocide, and deception, it still refuses to stay buried. To those who mock these connections, who deny this evidence, who claim this heritage while rejecting its true origins, your time of deception is coming to an end. The truth is emerging and no amount of ridicule, no amount of denial can stop it. The evidence is written in stone, documented in contemporary accounts, preserved in official records, and embedded in the very names of our oldest cities. Let's conclude by showing how prophecy confirms everything we've uncovered. Prophecies reveal America's true identity in these last days. In Daniel 7.25, we read of a power that would speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. Look at how precisely to the Esdras describes an eagle rising from the sea, spreading its wings over the whole earth. This isn't just ancient symbolism, but a direct vision of the nation that would dominate global commerce, military power, and influence, just as the eagle had opposing wings that grew smaller and weaker, we witnessed America's internal divisions and gradual decline. The prophetic phrase, time, times, and half a time, which translates to three and a half years, 42 months, and 1,260 days, aligns with the biblical principle of a day for a year. This signifies a period of exactly 1,260 years from the era of Muhammad to the commencement of America's ascendancy. The same period appears in Revelation 11.2. 
saying, but the court, which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not for it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall they tread underfoot 40 and two months, perfectly matching European colonization and the suppression of true indigenous identity. Just as Daniel prophesied, the little horn would wear out the saints and change times and laws. We've witnessed European powers systematically erase indigenous identity, change our customs and suppress our true history. This period of treading down was permitted for a specific time, 42 months prophetically representing 1,260 years of Gentile dominion. But now, as Jesus prophesied in Luke 21, 24, Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. As Isaiah 11, 11, 12 declares, the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. This gathering isn't happening in the Middle East. It's happening right here as truth emerges about who truly inhabited this land. Ezekiel 36, five speaks directly to this moment. Thus saith the Lord God, surely in the fire of my jealousy have I spoken against the residue of the heathen which have appointed my land into their possession with the joy of all their heart. The sealed records tell us why this time of treading down was permitted. So there would be no doubt about the true identity of the Israelites when the gathering begins. Just as Tutan Ezra's prophesied the eagle's wings would become small, tiny wings, we witness America's influence waning as divine justice unfolds. This isn't about human vengeance, it's about prophetic fulfillment. The same scriptures that foretold our scattering now guide our gathering as truth emerges despite centuries of suppression. This understanding comes now because we've entered what Daniel called the time of the end when many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. That's why we're uncovering historical records, finding these connections, seeing through the deceptions. The Most High is gathering his people, not through violence, but through revelation of truth that can no longer be hidden. When revelation speaks of those who say they are Jews and are not, it's exposing the same systematic erasure we've documented from the Spanish crown classifying indigenous peoples as Negroes to the deliberate relabeling of Carib chiefs as maroon Negroes in that 1773 painting. This deception wasn't random. It fulfilled the prophecy of crafty counsel against thy people from Psalms 83, where nations conspired to ensure the name of Israel may be no more in, in remembrance. The sealed portion reveals why this time of treading down was permitted so that in the end times there would be no doubt about the identity of true Israel when early Spanish chroniclers like Fray Diego Duran described encountering um, dark-skinned Ethiopian-like peoples throughout Mesoamerica when Cuervo Marcus documented that America was a Negro continent they were unwittingly preserving evidence that would surface at the appointed time just as Columbus's own margin notes show Native Americans reaching Ireland before 1492, just as Webster's 1828 dictionary preserved the truth about copper-colored races, these historical records were preserved to surface now at the end of Gentile times. This is why contemporary European accounts of advanced aqueducts and cities five times larger than London or Rome are emerging, they testify against those who claim to civilize an empty continent. The Most High permitted this treading down for a set time, exactly as Daniel prophesied. But now, as we reach the end of that period, truth pours forth like never before. The same prophecies that foretold our scattering now herald our gathering to those still mocking these connections, still denying the evidence in your own historical records. Understand what time it is, 
the period of Gentile dominion reaches its prophesied end. This isn't about vengeance, it's about restoration and divine justice. As we close today's episode, remember, history isn't always what we've been taught. Sometimes the most profound truths lie hidden in plain sight, waiting for those brave enough to see them. Keep questioning, keep searching, and most importantly, keep sharing these truths. This is Hidden History and Biblical Mystery, reminding you that the truth, no matter how long suppressed, cannot be hidden forever.